Good evening. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the trustees, the staff, the faculty, I want to welcome everybody to State of the School 2019. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super excited to see uh, such a packed room and, and so much energy. I have to say this is my absolute favorite event of the year. It's nothing but pure energy and optimism. And this is my seventh state of the school, but it's my first as president of the board. And I want to say it's an honor to represent all of you uh, in that capacity. It's an important responsibility and a grave responsibility. Uh, for me, it's also a labor of love. I will certainly uh, do my best. I'll be available if anybody needs to contact me um, in, in, my, in my capacity. And I hope to meet uh, as many of you as possible over the coming years. Though I know many of you, can't see you, but I know many of you out there, uh, I'm told I should do a brief introduction. So first, for new parents, my family and I are not descendants of the school's founders. Uh, <laughs> our name is just a happy coincidence that makes the school store a little more appealing. Uh, but, but my wife Lynn and I, and Lynn's uh, a trustee as well, have three kids at the, at the school. We have two seniors uh, and a freshman. And we were in England for 12 years, and we were at an international school that we absolutely loved, and we thought we could never replicate it. But we were lucky. Like all of you, we found King. And we chose King because we sensed that they were striving to set a better standard for education, and we have not been disappointed. It's been a place that's provided uh, challenges and support for our kids. They've grown as students, athletes, citizens, young adults, as they've learned to be their best selves. That is them, their first day of school seven years ago and just a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's actually been an amazing partnership with the teachers, the staff, the coaches, the other parents, and if you look closely, the orthodontist. Um, we are all in at King, and as are all your trustees, by the way, and we're excited to build on the energy and momentum of last year, Karen's first year. You have 27 strong, committed trustees, a new ambitious, ambitious strategic plan, and incredible momentum, and you're going to hear a lot about that tonight uh, from Karen. But before I turn it over, I want to say uh, a word of thanks for someone who has exemplified what it means to be a part of the King community. And I hope that you are all as inspired by him as I am. And I'm, of course, I'm talking about uh, my predecessor as board president, Tom Conheny. And given the magnitude of what he's meant to this school, I thought in this moment of transition, it made, a, uh, made sense to reflect for just a moment uh, on what he's meant to the school. As a parent, he and Roseanne brought their twin boys here in 2003 as first graders. Kelly came two years later, 2005, as a kindergarten student, and uh, much smaller than they are now. Um, and Tom joined the board in 2005. Uh, he held virtually every position on the board until becoming board president in 2015, which he held for four years. And by the way, Tom is still on the board, and, and during much of his time uh, on the board, he was also a very, very senior guy, one of the most senior guys on Wall Street. And so and those were tense years, uh, which I can attest to. So he was doing what our kids do every day, which is power multitasking. Um, but uh, he's been, and, and his family has been, uh, some of our most generous donors uh, in the history of the school. They brought to, Tom has brought to King leadership, judgment, commitment, and most importantly, a vision. And throughout its history, King has seized opportunities to invent and reinvent itself as it's tried to ask more of education. And Tom has helped transform the leadership team, the facilities, the programs, almost everything. During Tom's tenure, we built the pack, we renovated the upper school, we put in the turf fields, we created the innovation lab, we hired a new head of the upper school, the lower school, um, an overall new head. We revamped athletics, capital raising. Uh, in truth, there's almost no corner of this school that was not examined and made better. The definition of stewardship is to leave something better than you found it. And Tom has had 
perhaps one of the most profound impacts on this place as anybody in its long history. And that's, that's a big statement and that's a legacy. So, of course, uh, we will honor Tom properly at the gala in April, but for now, I would ask you to all join me in thanking Tom Conheny. Tom, please. Okay, so now let me introduce uh, the other star of the show. Uh, and first, let me say how lucky we are um, to have uh, Dr. Eshoo. When I was a CEO on Wall Street, I was fanatical about talent and leadership. And without those two things, you don't get innovation, you don't get execution. And we really have a rock star as our CEO. She has charisma, she's intelligent, and she's a proper educator. So for the new parents, let me briefly describe Karen's background. First, she's an experienced leader. She was already head of school for many years at the Vistamar School. She was assistant head of school at Lick Wilmerding, both in California. She's a skilled educator and has spent years teaching in independent schools. She has a BA in philosophy from the University of San Diego, a master's in education and history from Stanford, and a PhD in education from the University of California at Berkeley. And that's a pretty good matriculation list, even by King standards. <laughs> so, Without further delay, our head of school, Dr. Karen Eshoo. Good evening, everybody. Excellent job. You're actually here. I'm glad I see some drinks in hands. That will make this a lot more fun, that's for sure. Um, so first of all, I just want to echo um, Tom King's uh, comments about Tom Conheny. Um, I actually, while I worked with Tom as the head of school for one year, I really got to work with Tom for two years. Because it, between the time that I applied for the job and then actually moved to Connecticut, Tom uh, really has been my first and in many ways, I think most important teacher about King. Uh, I know history from Tom. I understand policy here because of Tom. I also understand how to think about our future from Tom. And so I think in many ways, every school kind of has its own language. So, you know, Tom is really responsible for teaching me how to speak King. Or I, actually, you are responsible for me to teach Kinglish. How about that? I just made that up. Yeah, we speak Kinglish here at King. Um, but really, Tom, I, really, I will always be grateful to you for everything that you've done for me and with me. And I'm so glad that I get to keep working with you. So thank you for that. Um, and so I want to give a special welcome because I definitely know from very recent experience how wonderful a place this is to be new. I want to welcome all of our new families to the State of the School Address tonight. So welcome to all of the new families. Let's welcome them together. And of course, now that I'm in my second year, I also know this is a great place to not be new. So welcome back to all of our returning families. Um, special welcome to all my colleagues who are joining us tonight. And then to everybody who is watching this tonight, whether you're on, um, on live stream or later on watching the recorded version of this, welcome to all of you. Special shout out to all of our alums who might be watching us tonight from wherever. So tonight, I am really excited to share with you a preview of the King School Strategic Plan. And tonight, I'm going to be talking with you about that strategic plan and lots of different ways in which King is setting the standard. Now, what I would like you to think a little bit about is um, strategic plans are, you know, are, are pretty common, I think, in schools. And ours will be a five-year plan, um, like many of them are. And yet, as you hear me describe some of the initiatives that we are going to undertake, Really what we're doing is preparing not just for King 2025, we're really setting the foundation for King 2050. All of the decisions that we make now are going to really be designed to keep us a robust, growing, evolving, and compelling institution 30 years from now, not just five years from now. That's what makes this work so exciting. 
Now, the strategic plan is really one of the most important ways that the Board of Trustees partners with the head of school. And, uh, and also, by extension, the head of school's team. And so the work that's been done has actually it really got started last year. So you're looking at months and months of work um, in terms of what I'm going to be showing you. And the other thing to keep in mind I, is that I hope that as you hear me describe the direction of King, because really, I'm describing to you our future. We are designing our future right now. Your voices should be evident in here because all of the work that we did was really informed deeply by what we know from all of the members of our community. So whether that was because you came and visited me in my office and had conversations with me during my entry process last year, whether it was students that I met and heard from, alumni, I met a ton of alumni last year hearing about our history and where they hope our future is gonna go. All of that has informed our thinking about who we are today and who we know we want to be and need to be in the future. And that's why I'm so excited about this. This is actually some of the most fun we've gotten to have, um, and I'm so excited to share this with you tonight. So what you're going to see tonight is three pillars. We're going to talk about how we are setting the standard for education, also setting the standard for a sustainable future, and finally, setting the standard for institutional excellence. Now, under these three pillars, I'm going to be sharing with you a total of nine initiatives. And in doing so, uh, we, are, we are really seeking to make our mission come to life day in and day out here at King. The most important line of our mission, I think, is the one that we all probably could rattle off, and that is that King prepares students to thrive in a rapidly changing world. So every time we undertook another initiative, we had to look at it through that lens. Everything that we do is designed to prepare students for the actual world that they are going to enter, not the world that we left behind. And that actually calls us to think somewhat differently about the way that we deliver education. And so with that, we're going to start, no surprise, with education. And we have five initiatives under this pillar that I'm going to share with you. We're going to start with academic excellence. I'm going to share with you our initiative around athletics specifically, and then more broadly, wellness. From there, we're going to talk about some exciting new uh, directions we have for community partnerships. And then finally, the cornerstone of our fabulous community, inclusion. And so we're going to start here with academic excellence. Now, when I think about academic excellence and I think about the legacies that really help to inform this way of thinking and being, I think of the Low Haywood School. Uh, Louisa Lowe and Edith Haywood, the two founders of that school, uh, and that was a school for girls, in case you weren't aware of that. Their goal always was to provide the most excellent education possible for those girls. They were committed to challenging them in real ways. They were committed to making them work hard, for sure, and in doing so, prepare them to be purposeful human beings. That was Low Haywood School. And that part of our legacy remains with us today. In fact, the way I just described it, I hope you agree with me, really reflects the school that we're, we're literally sitting in right now. So as we think about how we take that core of who we are and start to propel forward, we start to think a little bit differently about what kinds of challenges our students need and what authentic challenge really looks like. Because what we know is memorizing a lot of facts is not really going to get them very far anymore. Not in a Googleized world where you can just ask the Google anything you want and get the answer. Instead, and you've heard me talk about these concepts before, what we know our students need is to learn how to research well. That, in, that includes, obviously, looking for information, being able to find the right information, but also telling good information from bad. Because as information proliferates, a lot of it is, of, of course, in incredibly low quality. On top of that, it's not just about finding it. Our students need to learn analysis skills. They need to learn synthesis skills. And they need to be able to connect concepts that seem to be disconnected 
but they need to do that in order to make something new. Now, in order to do that, our students have to develop ways of thinking and being as students while they're with us that prepare them to be nimble in doing this work. They have to be able to turn on a dime and actually be excellent learners because they're gonna need to keep learning different skills throughout the rest of their lives. One, th one set of skills is just not gonna cut it anymore. On top of that, and this is actually the part that gets us probably most excited at the school, they need to take what they learn in school and be able to apply it outside in the world. Now, I usually hesitate to say out in the, the real world because it feels pretty real in here to us too. But at the same time, the world outside of King is very different than the normal that we create here for our students. But we want the normal here to prepare them really well for whatever they're going to find. So to that end, we, um, we're looking at programs that will allow students to think more about things like content mastery. Content mastery is different than just content knowledge because you can know something for a little while, but then it can just kind of flit out of your brain. What we want to look for are different ways for students to demonstrate deeper understanding, and that is going to require some different ways of teaching and learning. Beyond that, they need to be able to practice those real world scenarios where they're going to have to demonstrate that learning to others, not just their, not just their peers and their teachers, but others from the outside. Now, in this initiative, like all of the initiatives you're going to see, a lot of this is actually already happening here at the school. All of the, all of the work that we plan to do in the future is inspired what we're really good at already. So, for example, this summer, we, uh, we have unveiled, actually, a brand new program in our lower school. Our early childhood program for the pre-K and the K is now a Reggio-inspired early childhood program. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the short story is that Reggio Emilia, um, which you've probably heard of before, is a region in Italy. But it's a region where the folks there have doubled down on research on early childhood education to find the best ways to bring out the curiosity and cultivate it in the youngest children and actually teach them to be researchers in their own world. So what our students are doing in those earliest years here at King, learning to ask the right questions. That's always the most important part of a research project. How do you ask the right question? It can take years sometimes to actually hone that down. But teaching students to keep asking questions, then go out and collect some data and then draw conclusions from that. Now, while we usually associate that with older students, our youngest students are sometimes best at this because they're so curious and there's nothing yet that's getting in their way. They come to it naturally and therefore develop the habits. And so what we want is that kind of attitude towards learning to continue to spiral through our curriculum in very, very intentional ways. Now, when we think about the middle school and the way that those skills will then manifest in the middle school, um, this is one of the reasons actually why I'm just so thrilled that we have welcomed Dr. Josh Deitch to our middle school as our new head of middle school. Because Josh is somebody who is, first of all, a committed, God bless you, middle school person. He is a middle school person. He's not just somebody who teaches and then sometimes like hangs out with middle schoolers. This is the age that he knows best and respects and loves. And that is what compels him to create the best atmosphere possible for middle school students. Because those are the students actually who are oftentimes at the greatest risk of, of kind of losing their curiosity. Because so much is changing in their bodies and in their brains and everything else, they sometimes will kind of pull back into themselves, they won't, they'll stop trying new things, unless of course they are surrounded by adults who know them well and who love them well also. Now, we probably all know it can be kind of tough to love a seventh grader sometimes, but our colleagues definitely know how to do that because they know how to meet them where they are, make them feel safe enough to be uncomfortable so that they can continue those skills that I've already described to you. And that's Josh's top priority, to foster the conditions where this kind of thinking and learning can take place and not take a dip. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately for so many students, that's exactly when that happens, not a king. Definitely not a king. And, uh, and then in the upper school, we've been inspired by some pretty amazing research programs that I've, act I've actually described to you a little bit before I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you right now. Um, we, we have always believed very much, because uh, we consider ourselves like to be a liberal arts educa um, education institution, 
We believe very much in research, of course, in math and science, and we also believe very strongly in research in the humanities. Frankly, research really should go across the board for all disciplines. And we've had a couple of families who have stepped forward to actually support some programs in research that are turning out to be really quite impressive and also very distinctive. This is not what you see at other schools. Now, first of all, there is the, uh, there's the Advanced Math and Science Study Program. It's the AMSSP. And that is a program that is designed for students who really want to do research, um, both here in school, through the Aspire course that is taught by Dr. Victoria Shulman, and then also outside of school with actual scientists. So for example, last year we had three seniors who were part of this program. It's a two-year program. All three of these seniors got internships at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Each one of them worked in a different lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and each of them was studying and working on research on cancer with the actual scientists who were running the studies. Now, these girls worked incredibly hard, as you could imagine. I mean, they were traveling, you know, up to, you know, down to New York and, and doing this work while still carrying a full load here, and they just did phenomenal work. Now, not only was that um, like, um, an unbelievable experience for them, and again, somewhat unusual, this is something that also made them extremely attractive to colleges, because they didn't just have excellent grades to show these, these colleges, they were able to demonstrate mastery. That's what we're talking about with mastery. They could demonstrate mastery because they'd actually done it. It's learning by doing, and that enables them to go more deeply. That also gives them a story to tell that most students out there don't have. Now, on the other side, um, the other picture you see there on the right, that is the faculty advisor, Mr. Ian Lear-Nickham, with his two students, who were the recipients of the Tom Main uh, the Tom Main Humanities Fellowship. Now, this was funded by the Miller Chip family, and they, because they believe very strongly in humanities research. So, we had students who applied to do research projects that would have involved questions around climate change, around healthcare in the developed world, around, um, let's see, and then around, Sorry, I just lost my one. Uh, and then also around climate change. Now, with, what these two students did actually, who got the scholarship this last summer, was they traveled to both Europe and South Asia. They interviewed uh, different people about climate change and then did research on climate change, all under um, Ian's guidance, and then um, have put together a research project that they're gonna be presenting to their peers and to faculty in the next couple of weeks. Now again, they were out in the field talking to the people who were actually doing the work, so learning from those who were actually doing it, and actually acting like sci and actually acting like sociologists and researchers. So that is very different than just write. That's more and very different than just writing a paper in your class. Now, with all of those kinds of experiences, what we see the possibilities for here, and certainly what the Miller Chip and the Nash family saw, and in fact, the Nash family was so thrilled with how well this program was doing, the AMSSP, that they, they actually raised their initial donation from $250,000 of seed money, they raised it to a million. They were so thrilled with the results. So what this, is, what this is showing us is that we've got an opportunity here to create these kinds of opportunities for our top students who are interested in doing actual work in the fields of interest that they have to really do something special with that. And this is something that we want to leverage for the future. And again, what we know is that's the kind of work that's actually going to prepare them for the world that they're going to enter because they're going to practice it now so that they can continue it later. That's setting the standard. Next, I'm going to talk to you about setting the standard for athletics. Now, for athletics, this is, this is the initiative that always reminds me of Hiram King. He is the gentleman who founded the King School. This was a, a school for boys. And the reason why is because Hiram King was quite clear that an excellent education 
had to include both excellent academics and excellent athletics. He was committed to both sides of that coin, and he, th and he believed very strongly that one had to go with the other in order for an education really to be thorough and excellent. Now, King, in all of our iterations over the decades, has always had a commitment to athletics, and in fact, our athletics program is quite robust and definitely competitive. Now, what we're talking about here in this initiative is actually doubling down on that competitive edge, but doing it in a very particular way that really reflects our values as a school. So our goal through this initiative on athletics is to raise our competitive edge in our athletics program, and I'm talking across the board, all of the boys sports, all of the girls sports, all of them, to make sure that we are building the best and strongest culture across the board consistently on every team, and that that culture is focused very clearly on teamwork and perseverance and respect, and very importantly, leadership. Now, we definitely know that there are lots of examples already of the, of the ways that that manifests on our sports team. One of the inspirations, actually, for this initiative is, for example, the girls' volleyball team. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you know I posted about this last night. If you don't follow me on Instagram, come on, I've been here for a year. You should be following me by now. But last night I posted at the game, um, when I was at the game, because this is, this is a team that somehow or another always finds a way to win. Now, they, they won this match in five games, so you know they, they've definitely fought for it. But I, when I was watching the second game, they were down, I think it was 18 to 6, and it looked like Cheshire was just going to walk away with this game. Um, and then all of a sudden, it was tied, and then it was neck and neck. Now, we did lose that game by two points, but we lost 25 to 23 in that one game, and then came back and won the entire thing. That's a team that knows how to win. And the reason why is, because, is, is partially because we have fabulous girls on that team. I mean, this little tiny girl just did this huge hit. It was just amazing. And that little tiny girl with the huge hits, who is amazing, could not have done what she had if she had not had the teammates around her and if her coach had not set the standard on that team for teamwork, for perseverance, for respect, and for leadership. That's core. It all flows from that. And so what we really want to do is make sure that we are attracting the best coaches that we can find. That means coaches that really share our values as a school, not just, not just winning. Trust me, I want to win. I always want to win. And uh, I am not somebody who wants to win at all costs. We do not sell our soul because uh, we want to win a game. We want coaches who understand that. And we also want coaches who are going to hold our, our students accountable to these values. And we want to make sure that that is the case on every single team, every single day, every single year. We want that to be the hallmark of the school, that's for sure. And again, we're already doing this so well, we're looking forward to building this even more. Now I'm going to talk to you about setting the standard for wellness, because wellness is a little bit broader than athletics. It certainly includes it, but I'll describe it to you this way. What we certainly know about teaching our students to thrive in the world, uh, in, the, in the rapidly changing world, is that that is not the same as preparing them just to survive it. I don't want our students to just survive the world. I want them to find their place in it. I want them to feel agency, and I want them to feel like they've got this. Now, in order for that to happen, we have to take wellness very, very seriously. Unfortunately, sometimes it can, when schools don't take this seriously, it can just be like one, uh, one more item on a really long to-do list for our students. And here at King, we already have actually some amazing programs that are set up to start to teach students how to take care of themselves like it really matters. But where we're really planting a flag with this initiative, and really, I think, setting the standard the way that we need to as the school that we already are, 
is by prioritizing this in our curriculum. So what we know we need to do is we know that we need to make time in our curriculum to actually teach students how to do this. Sometimes this is happening already. We have students who are learning mindfulness from their teachers. Um, tomorrow morning, there's a teacher who's going to take her kids to the JCC, um, and they're going to take a spin class together, and then they're going to do a whole research project on it. And I'm going to go to that spin class with them. It's going to be great. And But the thing is, is that that's part of their academic curriculum. On top of that, what we know we want to do more of is we want to put ourselves as the adult community in the position to actually learn right alongside with them. We as adults oftentimes give ourselves a lot of passes for this, right? We'll, like, we'll give ourselves a pass and actually check our cell phones while we're in the car with the kids, um, or talk on the phone when we're picking them up in line, or, you know, or, or not actually take time to sit down for a really good dinner together and actually make human connections. And the thing is, is it, I mean, I give myself passes too, I think we all do. So as a school community, really what we're going to be working on is teaching each other as adults so that we can be the best models possible for our children. They need to see us taking this seriously if they're really going to be the kind of happy and healthy and purposeful adults that I know we all want them to be. And so that means programming, that means consistency, and that means prioritizing it, taking care of yourself like it really matters. That's what it means to set the standard for this. Now, next, I'm going to talk to you about our initiative around community partnerships. And for community partnerships, when I think about legacies, I think about the legacy of Mabel Thomas. Now, Mabel Thomas uh, was the founder of the Thomas School. It was over in Rowayton. Um, the other two founding schools were here in Stanford. And Mabel Thomas was, uh, was a fan of John Dewey. She was a fan of the progressives. And she really believed in learning by doing. She didn't want an education to only happen on a school campus. She believed really strongly that if you're going to understand what culture is, you have to get out there and be in it. You've got to go see plays. You've got to go see uh, your city government. You've got to get out there and meet people and apply your learning all the time. So in, in when I think about the way that I, we want to see that manifest here at King, we're already inspired by programs that we have here, things like King Cares, for example, where we do wonderful service work with some pretty amazing nonprofits in this area. And that has to continue. And there's more to community partnerships that actually will allow our students to start to apply the understanding that they have here, and most importantly, practice problem-solving skills out in the outside world. And again, work alongside others who are already doing that in order to make the world a better place. Now, the people who are out there making the world a better place sometimes are working, frankly, in local government. Those are people who are actually doing. They don't do that to get rich. They're doing that to actually serve their towns, their regions, whatever it is. There are some people actually in for-profit companies that are out there working to make the world a better place. And I think sometimes it can be easy to forget that. There are some fabulous for-profit companies that are out there trying to solve very complex social problems and also make a profit at the same time. So what we'd like to start to do is explore possibilities for our students, not just to do service, but to actually start to understand why certain problems exist. So for example, we, have lot, we know that we, we do a lot of food drives here, and that's great because we help get food to people who need it. But what I also want our students to start to understand, and they can actually understand this developmentally at lots of different ages through our school, I want them to understand why people actually are hungry. What, is, what are the problems that are actually creating that? And then what are the different ways that people are going about solving those problems? Problem solving skills are the skills that our students desperately need as they go out into the world. And the more that they can practice that, especially when it's something that they actually care about, the better it gets. Now, one of the examples that I think is a really wonderful one of something becoming more personal for students and causing them to learn more deeply as a result is our partnership with uh, a group called the Orphan Starfish Foundation. Now, this is a group that is a non this is a nonprofit group. They actually support orphanages in many different places. The one that we have the relationship is an orphanage that happens to be in the country of Colombia. Now, our soccer team, and that's actually uh, that's actually Inzenio. 
our soccer coach, he actually has gotten his boys on the soccer team connected with this organization. And you know, there was a there was a point in our relationship where we raised we were just raising money for them, and we will be doing that again this year. Actually, at homecoming, we'll be doing the 5K to support this and actually one other organization as well. But what started to happen over the last couple of years is that our students from King actually began to develop relationships with the kids in this orphanage. And they now have traveled to Colombia, spent time with them there. Uh, the common language that they speak is soccer, for sure, or football, depending on who you're talking to. And what's happened to these boys over the course of that relationship, especially when then the Colombian kids came here to King and were hosted by the boys in their own homes, is that rather than it just be about raising money that you send away somewhere to something that you think is pretty good, now it's personal. And now these students are actually curious about why things are the way they are. And they are certainly even more interested in raising money, but they're actually now starting to think about that orphanage as a problem to be solved, or actually the manifestation of problems to be solved. That's the kind of thinking I want our students to be more in touch with. Service is always important, but going more deeply and giving our students the, the, the skills and the agency to know that they can actually make positive change in the world, that's something that you just can't put a price on. And that's why it's setting the standard. And then finally, in, uh, in this section on education, I'm going to talk to you about inclusion. Now, in, you'll notice that um, it is just the word inclusion here, because this really is the focus of this initiative. Now, diversity and inclusion usually go together. And diversity, of course, is about representation. And when I've talked to alums in particular um, from all different parts of our history, they always have remarked on their pride that this has been the school, it threw out, th really throughout all of our history, that has probably been one of the most diverse in the area. And that's been on purpose. This has been a place, because sometimes in many ways because of our location, that's been accessible to so many different families from so many different zip codes, from so many different towns in the area, that we are probably probably the best reflection of our area of anybody. Now, representation is really important, and that will always be important to us. Inclusion is really where it all, all the rubber hits the road. And inclusion really is our commitment to making sure that everybody in our community feels like a homeowner, not just a welcome guest. Now, we are definitely a lovely community. Um, our kids get along well. That's absolutely true. And what we're committing to in this particular initiative is ensuring that we get really, really sophisticated about both the understanding of what it means to include everybody fully and make sure that everybody has full access to everything that we offer here, and also making sure that we practice it. So when we, uh, when we ask the right questions of each other in our community to understand each other's experiences, and you know that we're a student-centered school, we're also a family-centered school. We want to make sure that everybody is actually um, experiencing the school the way that they should. Uh, when we learn more about people's experiences, then we need to be open to doing things differently sometimes to ensure that everybody feels included. And again, feel like a homeowner here, not just like a welcome guest. Now, one of the things that, we're, that we did this last year to start to set the stage for some of this really exciting work was to hire a new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We call it DEI for short. Her name is Dr. Rochelle Jean-Baptiste. She's actually here with us tonight, so you'll get to meet her. She's wearing a red dress, so she's going to be really easy to see. And Rochelle actually has been doing this work in higher education for a long time, and I'm really excited for you to meet her. Um, really, what she's going to be doing is getting to know the community so that we can get to, so that we can really understand each other as well as possible. And there, there are lots of ways to do this. But I think that probably the most important reason we need to do this is because our students need to learn how to leverage the relationship, the relationships that they have with one another for their academic learning. Now, this is something that has been actually demonstrated in research time and again. Students who learn in a diverse environment, and certainly an inclusive environment, 
actually learn more academically, they get better grades academically, and they go further academically than students who learn from pe around people who are just like them. The reason why is the same reason, quite frankly, that businesses that have diverse workforces and diverse boards are more profitable. It's because when you're around people who don't look like you or think like you or have the same life experiences as you do, you are actually being pushed to challenge your assumptions all the time, you're being pushed to think differently, and you're being pushed to think more. And that's why the learning goes more deeply as a result. There are actually academic benefits to this. And like I said, it's been demonstrated in research time and again. Now, we probably all kind of have a sense of that just because of our own anecdotal experiences. But we want to leverage that to make sure that we're doing the absolute best job. And, so, and you'll be hearing more about the way we're going to set the standard for that quite soon. So again, Thinking about all the ways that we're going to be building academic program here. We're talking about academic excellence, athletics, the broader concept of wellness, community partnership, and inclusion. So now, I'm going to take a breath, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we're going to set the standard for a sustainable future. Now, I will tell you that really, literally, every independent school in the United States is having a conversation about what it means to be sustainable, because our model is a tough one, and we want to make sure that we remain. So the ways that we're going to come at this challenge are the following. We're going to talk about strategic enrollment management. That's a, that's a kick up from what we usually have just talked about as admissions. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, some thinking and actually some action we're about to take around facilities and development. And then finally, we're going to talk about financial sustainability as well, which is obviously the foundation of all of this. Now. First of all, when it comes to our current enrollment, this is our current enrollment. It is extremely strong. I am thrilled to stand here and tell you that we have had growth in every division coming into this school year. So hooray for us. Now, one of the other things that I think is important about this is to understand that I'm, I'm looking around the room. I mean, first of all, I, I know Nina Newman is right there. So Nina Newman and her team certainly deserve a lot of credit for this. All of my colleagues here deserve a lot of credit for this because they are the ones who really make this the school where students want to be. And as I look around the room, I know that all of you get credit for this too, because I know that you're out there spreading the good word about King School. That's how it works, and we're really grateful for that. So keep doing that. Definitely keep doing that. It's obviously working. Now, one of the things that we know, though, about enrollment is that it, it's never a given. We can never, ever take our strong enrollment for granted. And so as demographics shift, and as we have to continually make the case just for independent schools in general to a lot of people who may not really be familiar with independent schools, we know we have to keep ahead of the game by being very strategic in how we actually out, do outreach to different families. Now, now, some of that outreach really does happen as a result of our own community, as I was saying. Other kinds of outreach um, are ones where we actually want to make sure that we're, we're taking a close look around the area at where we can draw families who really would be um, like amazing members of our community. We know we want really strong students. We know we need to get students in here who are also excellent athletes and also excellent actors and musicians and overall just interested and interesting students. We know we, that we, that's who we already are. We know we have to go out there and find them. Now, some of the families out there who are our people are families who can pay the full cost of our tuition. There are also lots of families who are our families who cannot pay the full cost of tuition. And I'm very proud to say that we have, and have had for quite some time now, a very robust program in financial aid to make this school as affordable as possible for the families who we want to have. And in line with being strategic about this, you're going to start to hear us talk about financial access at this point, rather than financial aid. The term financial aid has been around for a long time. Most schools around here still use it. Um, but it's, it's actually not used by schools all over the country anymore. Part of the reason why is because the term itself can be a little challenging for families. It's something that can actually feel a little bit embarrassing to people, because it feels kind of like a handout, even though that's not what it is. 
case, that's sometimes how it can feel. But the reason why we actually prefer the word access is because that is actually what we strive to do. We strive to find our families out in our region and provide access to them. The indication there is that in doing so, we are establishing a relationship with families. And again, going back to my earlier comments about making sure that everybody feels like a homeowner and not just a welcome guest. When we talk about financial access, it's a signal to those outside of our community that we're serious about partnership with them. It's really about affordability, and it makes the conversation easier with the family who we really, really want to attract and actually get to come here at King and yield. And so that's one of the things that's going to be changing, it's just in terms of the language. Now, the way that the program works really will not be different. It really is about ability to pay. And at the same time, it's one of the ways that we are thinking about how to make sure that we maintain our diversity here at King. Because like I said, every student in this school benefits from the diversity in this school, academically, socially, and emotionally. And we want to make sure that we're doing this in the way that shows us quite clearly as the most respectful school when it comes to bringing in families through a program like that. That's who we are, and we want to make sure that everything we do actually it manifests that commitment. So that's what we mean by strategic enrollment and management. Okay, now it's facilities time. And this is actually going to be a really fun part of this presentation. So hold on to your seats. Here we go. Now, one of the things that I'm really excited about, because when you have a strategic plan, you, know, you really start to think about your future and about what the future of the campus is going to be. And so one, as we've been talking about what our, our guideposts are going to be as we make decisions about what to do with our school, there are a few things that we are committed to, definitely. The board is, I certainly am, and my team is too. What we want to make sure of is that as we think about evolving our campus, we obviously want to make sure that we are being as responsible as possible with the resources that we will have. Now, what that means is that we want to make sure that we are spending our money wisely so that it serves us not just for the next five years, but for the next 30 or 60. The other thing that we want to really keep in mind, and this is something that is extremely important to me in particular, is that we want to make sure that as we're either enhancing our current campus or building anything that's new, that we're building it to be as flexible as possible. Now, the reason why I say that is because I've been saying tonight, education has to change in order to prepare students for the real world. Now, what that means is that we have to be able to flex and bend in our facilities and use them for different things, um, rather than just having kind of unitaskers, right? Um, the, the days are gone when you just build a building to just do one thing. There needs to be flexible space so the teachers can use it flexibly to teach the students in the way that they need to be taught and so that students can learn the way that they need to learn. Now, all of that, of course, is, is about you know, good stewardship of our resources. Now, a great example of how this has already happened um, actually took place in the upper school building, which is where we're going to be very soon. And it was when the Innovation Lab actually came to be. Now, interestingly, the plan for that space was, a, was going to be a lecture hall. Okay, so the plans were going and every, we're going to build a lecture hall in this space. There's going to be this great big lecture hall. And then at some point, everybody involved took a step back and thought, wait a second. Is this really what we need? Is this really what our students need? And is this really what our teachers need in order to make our program the best program? And obviously the answer was no. The answer was that we needed a different kind of a space. We needed a space where students could go in and do multiple projects at the same time. We needed a space that actually could change relatively quickly and relatively inexpensively as students needed it to. We needed it to be, we needed it to be a place where lots and lots of different kinds of problem solving could happen. And that's what the Innovation Lab is. So if we apply that kind of thinking going forward, I think that we're really going to be doing things well. Well, and so that's always going to undergird our decisions. Now, happily, we're actually getting ready now to kick off a project that we are so excited about. And it actually is going to be happening right in the center of campus. I'm thrilled to tell you that, uh, that next summer, in June of 2020, we are going to break ground 
so that we can redesign and turf the middle field. This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. Now, with, yeah, you can applaud. Absolutely. I'm gonna take a sip of water. And thank you, because I got to take a sip of water, too, so that's great. So the way that this is going to work is this. Um, the, the field actually is, I think, an exciting project, first and foremost, because this is going to be a field that's accessible to literally every student on this campus. Everybody wins with this one. On top of that, in addition to, um, in addition to the fact that it will just be used for program during the day, it's going to serve just about every sport. There's going to be practice space, um, there's, and there's also going to be um, space on the field for games, obviously. Baseball, softball, uh, boys and girls lacrosse, boys and girls soccer, girls field hockey, all of those teams will get to use this field. So in addition to the Sagalas family field, which is, um, which is the, the turf field where we currently play football and all the other sports as well, we're now going to have two state-of-the-art facilities for our athletics program. We are so excited about this. Now, what's really exciting also is that the, the project was something that we had been, it, uh, folks had been thinking about even before I arrived, definitely. But as we were thinking about where we wanted to go for our future, and we were looking really for something to do first that, again, really would benefit every single student in this school, and we came up with this idea for the middle field, happily, the reason why I'm able to even announce it to you tonight is as we shared it with some families, there were some families who stepped up. So the first family stepped up and committed a million dollars to this project. This is a family who has chosen to remain anonymous, and uh, even in anonymity, I think that all of us need to thank this person for stepping up, because this is the person who actually <laughs> who made this possible. This is amazing. And one of the reasons why we just applauded that, that anonymous family is because that family inspired a second family to step forward and commit a million dollars. And that family uh, is the family of Nancy and Tim Armstrong. So I don't know if the Armstrongs are here. We're so grateful to the Armstrongs. And I, like almost at the exact same time, a third family stepped up and committed a million dollars. And that family is Lynn and Tom King. So to the Kings. Now we, we've actually raised a, a little bit over um, three million. We're at three million one hundred and fifty thousand dollars raised for this field project. This is incredible. The generosity of this community is, um, well, it's pretty humbling to stand up here and, and say this to all of you. So uh, from all of us to all of the donors, our gratitude um, will be flowing for quite some time. Thank you so much. Now, with all of this amazing fundraising, um, we do have a little bit, we do still have a little ways to go. Um, we need to get to about four and a half million to get everything done that we'd like to get done. And so what I know is that we're going to be hoping, at least, that some of you are going to be just as excited as we are and just as excited as our lead donors have been in kicking this off so that we can get this field completed by the by next fall. Now this is actually part of this task of setting the standard for the sustainable future. This really leads us into thinking about what financial sustainability really means. So part of, part of our sustainability, the things that are really going to take us into the year 2050, include major gifts. And you've already heard tonight about, again, the Miller Chip family um, supporting the Tom Main Fellowship. You heard about the Nash family who, who increased their gift incredibly to a million dollars. This year, we're looking to raise about two and a half million dollars in, um, in major gifts again. Some of this, again, is really going to be for the field. We want to make sure that we close out the fundraising on that, hopefully sooner rather than later. And I know that the senior parents have gotten together and are committing to helping to support at least a portion of that. So I'm really grateful to the senior parents for already committing. Now, beyond that, 
The same way that the, the Miller Chip family and the Nash family have supported programs here, what I would hope is that as you're thinking about the strategic plan and also all these great programs that are already happening here, that you'll be inspired to support some of those as well. These could be programs that you already know about that you would like to support and see go further. You might even have ideas for things that we could be doing that we haven't even thought of yet. Maybe something in community partnerships. Whatever it is, we would love to hear from you about that because we do all of this together. It's all about partnership. And then the other is obviously, you heard me talk about financial access. Uh, for a lot of families, what matters most to them is who their kids are sitting next to every day and learning from and with every day. And so to that end, supporting financial access, um, whether it's supporting just generally financial access or thinking about a scholarship, those are great ways to help us become sustainable. Because, of course, we are quite reliant on tuition for our budget, which I'm going to describe to you in just a moment. When we get these gifts in, it actually allows us to become even more robust in terms of our sustainability. Um, and that includes the endowment. So uh, if you've been coming to the state of the school for a while, you've seen slides of, of the endowment. Um, we, have, we have a very good endowment right now. We're, just, we're about $33.5 million total in that endowment. And what's imp I think especially important to note here is that this endowment actually grew from $20 million to over $33 million in a pretty short period of time, just four years. That's, un that's almost unheard of. And so, first of all, I just have to thank the community for, again, your foresight and your ability to pay things forward by giving to the endowment. Endowment. Because the larger our endowment becomes as it grows, the less reliant we have to be on tuition and the less vulnerable we are to the market forces. And so that is going to continue to be uh, an effort that we are going to be engaging in. And again, something that we hope that you'll join us in continuing to grow. Now, another part of sustainability outside of, of the fundraising we've been describing so far has to do with just how we how we take in and then and then spend our resources. Now, one of the things I'm very very proud of, and thank you to Kim Leaker especially and her team on this one, um, we do an excellent job of this school of managing our funds quite well. Um, we, as you can see, there is qu there's almost no gap between our revenue and our expenses. Now, one of the things I would like to just point out to you: the revenue, our revenue is on the left, and the white represents tuition as part of our revenue and obviously that's the biggest chunk right now so over time as we think about the next five years and even 30 years into the future what we'd like to see is that come down a little bit because again as our endowment grows we become less reliant on tuition and therefore less vulnerable to the market and um, and that actually makes us a stronger school now on the other side we also have our expenses, and the biggest portion of that pie chart actually is for salaries and benefits for our faculty and our staff, or as we lovingly call ourselves here, the staffalty. Now, the reason why that's so important is because any school that is worth its salt should be spending most of its resources on its people and on its program. That's what we do, because the next largest chunk is for the program. And so the reason why we prioritize that is because we have no school without my colleagues. They are the ones who make this school what it is every day. They are the experts who work with the students, who know the students, and take care of them in ways that even when they're still with us, sometimes it only happens when they graduate, but even when they're still with us, the students know is second to none. And that's why we prioritize that in the way that we use our resources. Now, another part of our resources, of course, has to do with our annual fundraising. And, um, and again, when we're looking at all these sources of non-tuition revenue, this will always be a part of what we do. So I now get to say thank you to everybody in the room, because last year we raised an incredible total of $2,189,000 2 for the annual fund. That is incredible. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, one of the things that we are thinking about as we think about annual fundraising going forward, uh, and you keep hearing me talking about setting the standard, we have decided that we are going to start using a different name for our annual fundraising. Because let's face it, like anybody can have an annual fund, but only we can have the King Fund. Now, 
the reason why we d we've decided to do this, actually a lot of colleges and universities started going this way um, a number of years ago, and actually some independent schools are starting to follow. The reason why is because, we, we, the reason why we prefer the King Fund is because really when you think about any kind of giving here at the school, your giving is very personal. I, I mean, I give to the school every year, and, and I give as generously as I can, because while this is my job, this is also personal for me. I care about this school and the people in it in ways that compel me to do more than I might for just any other job. Because especially as a head of school, I love my school more than I love my job, actually. I want to do whatever I can for the school. And so it's personal. And so because we are a school that really is all about relationship, we, we are referring to this now as the King Fund because this is about us. This is about our family, whether we're current parents, whether we're alumni, even students who are getting ready to graduate, thinking about what it means to be a philanthropist. This is about us planting a flag and saying that we support this place, that we want to see it continue to grow, and that we are committed to making that happen. That's the King Fund. And so this year for the King Fund, we are setting, a, a, we're going to stretch it just a little bit because it's always good to stretch ourselves a little bit, for a goal of 2250000 And this is going to, as we always do, this is all going to go towards people and program. That's what the King Fund supports, people and program. And you know why that's the most important thing to support. So we hope that you will give early and then give again. And um, we know that some of, you know, some of the work that we're going to be doing towards the King Fund, you'll also hear about when we start to talk about the gala that's going to happen in the spring. But as I encourage you, definitely, I, I, you know, I certainly hope that we get 100% participation from our parent body. That, that's for sure. Um, I'm actually really proud of our alumni. We actually had more participation from our alumni last year in giving than we've ever had in the school's history. And for that, we, I'm just eternally grateful. That's a great signal. But I'm also proud to tell you, the same way that I did last year, actually, that my fabulous Staffelty colleagues, all of us are, are pictured here together. Um, literally, as of, I think I was with Kim and Lauren this afternoon when the email came in, as of, I think, about 3.57 p.m., 100% of us have, par have committed to supporting the King Fund. So there you go. And so I, I hope that's at least some inspiration for you. I think that for all of us, um, we do this because, because this place means a ton to us. We mean a lot to each other, that's for sure, on the Staffelty. We work very closely together and, you know, we take our work very seriously and happily we don't take ourselves too seriously. We actually really take a, get a lot of joy from the work that we do. Um, now, I think that it is, um, it is absolute, I, I, I'm not even sure to you what words can really describe the depth of the leadership that the Board of Trustees provides for us every year as well. This is a group of folks who give their time, their talent, and their treasure to this school in ways that, again, are really quite humbling. This is a group that has always taken the lead. They've always, uh, they've always been the group that comes out uh, usually at about, tw I mean, at I believe about 25% of the total of our fundraising for the, for the King Fund every year. They've just been amazing in this. And I think especially as I think about the work that we've done together on the strategic plan, their vision for this school is, is really exciting. And that's why we, really, we actually have the courage to be able to say that we are the school that is setting the standard for all of this. It's because of the leadership of the board. So I'm grateful to the board as well for your presence here tonight and for your leadership, not just in the King Fund, but throughout all of the ways that you make a difference at the school. So thank you to our board of trustees as well. Okay, so this is how we're gonna create a sustainable future. <clears throat> Ultimately, we're gonna do this together because that's how we do it here at King. We lock arms and we do this together because this place is worth it and because our children are worth it. Now, 
finally, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we mean when we say that this is the school that is setting the standard for institutional excellence. Now, one of the things that I've talked about, uh, I think, a lot tonight is the legacies that really inform us today as a school, the legacy of the Low Haywood School, of the Thomas School, of the King School, and all of those iterations in, uh, that have come before us. And when I think about the ways in which their core values still show here today, it's, it's really inspiring to me, because I'll tell you, it didn't have to be that way. And yet, I also know that the version of the school that we are today certainly is different. And you know what? It should be different. We do not live in the past here. We are informed by the past, but we are now building our own future. So when we think about all that we have discussed together and how much I really have learned about this place, again, in all of its iterations as I've spent my first year really kind of getting schooled about the school, I am, I'm grateful really to the trustees, to my colleagues, to all of the parents, to students, to alums for explaining the soul of the school to me because I get it now. I get who we are. So the goal that we have here for this initiative is for all of us to find the language to express and articulate the incredible pride and confidence that I know that we all have in this place because I've heard everybody say it over and over and over again. Because this is not just a school, this is our beloved school. This is King School. So what I'm gonna share with you right now is just one way that we can think about starting to articulate that pride and that confidence. So I'm gonna ask you actually to just kind of humor me a little bit. And I want you to just close your eyes for a second. And I'm gonna describe this to you this way. At King School, we seek more than achievement for our students. We open minds and spark courageous thinking. Every day, our students discover and forge their unique paths to excellence as we teach, guide, and cheer them on. Because when we set better standards for both the experience and outcomes of education, students cultivate the insights and the heart to own their future. Okay, you can open your eyes now. So what I want you to just think about for a moment is how it felt to hear our school described that way. That's just one way that we can describe our school. And you're gonna hear lots of others in the coming weeks as well. But that's, I think, the encapsulation of the soul of this place. That is both the soul that we need to preserve and cultivate as well as evolve and grow. And so tonight, as we think about the strategic plan and what this means for how we set the standard for education and how we set the standard for a sustainable future and how we really look to celebrate our institutional, whoops, and also, we're gonna celebrate Jake in a second too. And also, sorry, sometimes this thing jumps. Um, and then also how we are going to really shout from the rooftops everything that we do and everyone that we are here at King. I'm so excited to go on this journey with everybody here tonight. I'm excited about what lays ahead. I'm excited about the challenges that we're taking on. Um, we are gonna choose to do this in the best way for students, which is not always the easiest way, but we know it's gonna be the best way for students. And I'm thrilled that everybody sitting in this room, everybody who's watching, and those who just can't be with us tonight are all our partners in this. We're gonna do this one together. And it's gonna be, it's going to be incredibly gratifying and a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to talking with you more about all of this um, when we get down to the Murray Center. There will be drawings of the field and you'll be able to ask some questions down there. Um, the next place where I'll probably see you is at Homecoming, which is coming up next month. That's always great. If you're a new family, don't miss Homecoming. It's just a fantastic day. And then I'll be sharing more details with you about some of the specifics of the strategic plan when we get back for the State of the School Part 2 in February. So with that, I thank you so much um, for listening tonight. I really appreciate it. And I'm now happy to introduce our president of the upper school student body, Mr. Jake Cohen, who is going to ring us into the...
Marissa. Thank you, Dr. Eshu. Hello all, I am Jake Cohen, and I am the Upper School Student Body President for the 2019-2020 school year. I represent all four grades of the upper school and act as the lead liaison between the students and the teachers. I've been at King since sixth grade, and every day I grow more and more grateful to come to this school. At King, there's a special passion in the teachers, students, and administration to learn, and the result is an energy that breeds growth, positivity, and motivation. So many of my teachers are dedicated to continuing their own professional training and gaining new knowledge, which enables us as students to gain a deeper, well-rounded understanding of the concepts they teach. For example, my biology teacher, Mr. Dave Felice, is currently building a six-foot, 240-gallon vivarium, which is a living rainforest ecosystem in his classroom. He hopes this will contribute to a conservation effort for Central and South American frogs. My classmates and I are working with Mr. Dave Felice to think through the complex decisions of how to best construct the vivarium. This unique experience is all possible because Mr. Dave Felice is sharing his passion with us to learn and to protect the environment. Yesterday at King, I walked through the front door and said hi to my football teammate, who's also my fishing buddy, enjoys nature, and volunteers at the Fairfield County Food Bank. I then walked down the stairs and on the way to lunch, passed a Little League World Series ESPN youth reporter, then an English and poetry teacher who coaches JV soccer and basketball and performed in Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing this summer. I then ate lunch with a friend who performed in the King School Musical in Edinburgh over the summer and who also leads a first grade book club, is on the peer review board and loves to draw. Clearly, the community at King is deeply involved in thought and activity. So I'm constantly growing and learning from my peers. Plus, what I love most about King is that apart from being multifaceted, the common denominator among all people is that they are kind, curious, and enthusiastic. In closing, I wanted to talk about the bell ringing tradition at King. Each year, as a community, the students and teachers bring in the new school year together. This year, as a graduating senior, I'll join my classmates in ringing the bells again at commencement. Now I want to invite the whole community here tonight to ring in another year of learning and growth with the bells that are being distributed. After the ringing of the bells, please join together in celebrating in the Murray Family Academic Center. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. I didn't know he was doing that. Mr. Murphy, it's awesome, yeah. That's super cool. All right, should I start it? All right, ready? Yes.